Romans chapter number 10 this evening. Romans chapter number 10. It's a privilege to be at our home church. Uh, when I looked at the schedule, I've been extremely busy, and I was surprised to see an open Sunday this Sunday. And God had all that worked out and uh, with Pastor asking me to preach and uh, then my daughter getting saved and, and being able to baptize her this morning. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. I had the privilege to baptize all of my kids in the pastorate. And Pastor was so gracious to let me baptize Rebecca. And uh, Operation Go International is our train, uh, Pastor just said it, our, uh, our mission is to train and equip Christians globally in how to win someone to Christ and in church planning. And we do that all over the world. Uh, Levi and I will be leaving Wednesday for the Philippines, uh, training a new director there, holding a International Soul Winning Directors Institute while I'm there and doing a lot of work. And uh, I'm in the Philippines every year, if not a couple times a year. And um, my daughter will be going with me in August. Uh, Hannah will be going with me as we go to Kenya. Be gone about three weeks and training in Uganda, uh, training four different tribes over in the Kenya area. I've got requests pouring in, and I ask you to pray. A lot of you, thank you. It's good to have a home church that prays for us, and many times I get stopped by members, and they say, hey, what about the building? Our ministry purchased the old independent bank building there at King and Dixie, and Lord willing, we'll be starting uh, uh, working on it. Nothing wrong with the building, beautiful building the Lord blessed us with, but we got to make it into our national headquarters. We've sold the building, finally got it under contract down in South Carolina. Once where the wood passed, we knew we had to sell that. We were already going to be doing that, but we were going to take a little bit more time. The Lord had other plans, and so we close out on that the end of this month, and that should give us a lot of the money we need to remodel this one. Brother Green's been helping with that and some others, and, and uh, we're going to be, if you enjoy demolishing inside walls and tearing stuff up, that's going to begin sometime this week. If you would like to help with that, we would love for you to. Please see me. Uh, I will have someone overseeing the demolishing to make sure only that which needs to be tore up gets tore up. But if you would like to help with that, we'd love to have you. And I do ask for your prayers. Uh, the ministry, were, this year we will surpass 100 countries. I've got a list of countries, uh, national pastors, our missionaries, much like the ones we have here, begging me to come. And when I mean beg, I'm not being dramatic. Literally, I've had several beg me to come. Uh, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Taiwan, Dubai, Spain, France. I could go on. The list goes on of countries that I've got a list of as soon as I can get there uh, and uh, be able to train pastors. And usually when we're somewhere, that doesn't mention uh, Latin America, which we've got a long request for that. Uh, our international Latin American director, Brother James Adams, getting up in years, and we're praying for the Lord to find someone he can train to replace that, but he and I will be together in Argentina this year, in Brazil this year, and a few other places. So I ask you to pray a lot more I could say, uh, but church, thank you so much for your prayers, and I ask you just to ask God to continue to bless the ministry. I'm excited about that headquarters. My goal, it may be an ambitious goal, but if you don't swing at something, you'll never hit anything, and so our goal is to have that building remodeled model done, ready to go by uh, the triumphant conference here at the church and be able to have an open house on that for our board members and supporters and plus home church here. So I ask you to pray about that. Romans chapter number 10 tonight, Romans chapter number 10. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. You'll know this first verse and you'll know these verses very familiar, but I just want to draw some truths from the, with the help of the Lord tonight and hopefully be a blessing to you. Romans chapter 10 Verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ain't that a great truth? I'm glad that'll work anywhere and for anyone. Amen. Amen. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. A few years ago, there was an email that was sent that had a picture in it, and the caption read, that's not my job, the not my job award. And the picture was taken on a highway in Litchfield Park, Arizona. 
In the middle of the roadway were the remains of a possum that had, uh, I guess, uh, suffered the unfortunate fate of becoming roadkill. Down the center of that highway, a road crew had painted two fresh new yellow lines. However, when they came to the dead possum, rather than moving it, they just painted the yellow lines right over its body. Someone on the crew probably said, that's not my job to move it. I tell you that there are over 3,400 distinct people groups in the world that have never heard a true presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you quote numbers like 8 billion this year, we surpass 8 billion souls in this world and over 65 million of them died last year. That's about conservative numbers, 178,000 people a day die. That means every hour, 7,200 people die. That means every 60 seconds, 116 people die. And the latest statistic that I read said that only 3% of people that die attend a church of any kind. That means somewhere around 7,000 people is going to go to hell every hour that you and I live. That's staggering. When we hear numbers like that, that means that easily five to six billion people in this world are lost and do not know the Lord. And we know half of them have never heard a true presentation of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And sometimes there's a danger when we hear those kinds of numbers and we hear about the world and the 1040 window, we will consciously or unconsciously think to ourselves, well, that's not my job. You might not say it that way. You may instead say something like, well, I'm not called to the mission field. Which is in essence saying it's not my job. That's someone else's job. That's Austin's job. That's, that, that's this brother Rupel's job. It's someone else's. Those that have been called. A missions book discussed how many times Christians shirk their responsibility for missions claiming that well, I have not personally been called to missions. The author countered that by saying God's will for each of his children is in the context of his mission, that universal plan and purpose for Jesus to be known and worshiped among every tribe, every tongue, every language, every nation. So I'm saying tonight, church, whether you and I realize it or not, whether we accept it or not, if I could put it this way, missions are our mission. Missions, if I can make it more personal, missions are your mission and my mission. Every one of us that believe the gospel have been called to actively participate in the spread of that gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Romans chapter 10, we find a text that uh, you might call the chain of missions. Paul starts at the end of the chain with those who hear, whose service will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he then connects that person who believes all the way back to those who sent a preacher of the gospel to them. As a believer, you and I are a link in that chain of missions. And I want to challenge you and I this evening to not be a weak or broken link in that chain. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll give you a few points this evening. Father, I thank you for your grace and for the privilege to be in your house. Thank you for, Lord, our family having the privilege of being members of First Baptist Church of Bridgeport and me being the president of Operation Go, and Lord, just what you're doing in the ministry, I don't take any of it for granted. And then God, what an honor and privilege to stand behind this pulpit in this church. And Lord, I pray you use us tonight. I don't want to just fill a spot. We've got a great pastor and a great preacher. He could have done, a, no doubt, a far better job than I, but you've put me in this spot. And so I pray you use me, anoint me, and God, anoint your hearers tonight, Lord, and help us to say something as our pastor mentioned in Sunday school this morning, that would affect our heart. And Lord, that inward change and in work would be evident outwardly in what we do for the cause of Christ. 
Use the message I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want you to notice, number one, there is a universality in the promise of the gospel. Years ago, one of the early chairmen of the Coca-Cola company set a goal to see a bottle of Coke within the reach of every person on the globe. That was their mission. It's a goal that Coca-Cola has essentially reached at this point in time. My wife and I were missionaries in Papua New Guinea. We were in some remote, remote areas, and they would still have little old stands with, with thatch hut and, and, and bamboo uh, made, and they would still sell hot, mind you, hot bottles of Coca-Cola. I've been in Africa in some very remote areas. Two things you're going to guarantee to find, a smartphone and a bottle of Coca-Cola. I've been in one of the poorest areas of India last year. I couldn't find Coke Zero, but there was no problem seeing Coke bottles everywhere. There's hardly any place in the world you can go that you'll not see that familiar red logo. And behind that success, the chairman made this statement. It was his assumption that my product, Coca-Cola, a sugary carbonated beverage, is something that everyone in the world would want if they could just taste it. That kind of assumption and ambition fueled a global company like Coca-Cola, and may I say that assumption and ambition should be even more of a reality to the people that know Jesus Christ that if we could just get the gospel and just get Jesus to those that don't know it, they'll want to taste and have a part of this gospel. There's a universal hope and promise to be found in the message of the gospel. Paul touched on it in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now notice the reach of that promise includes me and you. Notice that word, whosoever. It's a big word. It's a grand word. And when we read it, the first person we ought to think about is ourselves. One writer said, I'm thankful that God wrote the word whosoever. If God had said there was mercy for and he put his name, then I would think that I'm the only one. But because God said whosoever, it invites everyone. You and I sit here today in a belief in the power and universal promise of the gospel first and foremost because we have personally experienced it ourselves. We know the gospel will work for whosoever believes it because it worked for us when we believed it. If we understand our own condition, we know that we are as lost as the vilest pagan in the depths of the remotest jungle. We're as blind as the most devoted Muslim in other countries. We're as unworthy as the dirtiest rottenest sinner in the streets of the biggest city. We were lost and undone, but the power of the gospel was he powerful enough to open our eyes and God was gracious enough to save us from our sins the moment we believed. And with thankful hearts, you and I can read verse number 13 and realize that the reach of that promise includes us. We're one of the whosoever's. The reach of that promise. But notice the reality of this promise induces. The promise does not only include me, but the reality of this promise induces me. Look at verse number 13 again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that is true, and we know it is because it was true for us as one of the whosoever's, then that promise must have some kind of impact on how we look at the world. We have to recognize that wherever the gospel is preached, when someone hears it and believes it, they will be saved. What this means is there is no country, there is no people group that the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot impact and affect. This was made light to me several months ago. I write our newsletter. It's a four-page letter that goes out every month for Operation Go, and I've been writing it now for almost a year. And, and, I was, and every month we, I put a devotion at the first of it, and, 
And the Lord had drawn my attention months ago to Mark chapter 16, verse 15. We know the verse and we know it well. The Bible said, he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But what grabbed my attention, pastor, was the last two phrases to every creature. I never thought of that before, but I thought, okay, God, every creature. Why did he use the word creature? He could have used another word and it would have been just fine. But notice he said every creature. That word, Greek word for every in Mark 16, 15 is the word pos. It's the same Greek word that's translated into several other words that I believe give us great insight. This same Greek word is translated whosoever 31 times in your King James Bible. And one of them times is John 3, 16. Think about that. God wants us to know that there are no limits or boundaries on who we give the gospel to. This Greek word that's translated every uh, is, is translated also, the same Greek word is translated whosoever. It's also translated six times whatsoever. Now that really helped me. It just showed me, God, none of this, which I already knew, but it just reinforces none of what's going on today catches God by surprise. Think about Mark 16, 15. Go ye all the world, preach the gospel to whosoever creature, that's that Greek word, pos, but every creature, same Greek word, I'm not correcting the Bible, I'm just saying it means whosoever, it means every, but it also can mean whatsoever creature. Well, I thought that was interesting. In the day that you and I live where unfortunately boundaries and distinctions and gender and other areas are called into questions, it does not change the responsibility we have to give the gospel to everybody. That word's also translated in scripture all manner of. Simply speaking, regardless of their sin, their race or their station, our commission and calling remain the same. But what grabbed my attention was that word creature. Why creature? That word intrigued me. God could have used the word people, persons, nation, mankind. Why creature? Well, I looked it up and I found that it simply means the act of creation are to be created by God. Now, I think that says more than we may realize God's the creator of everyone and everything, is he not? And by using the word creature, creation, God is reminding us that these people that may be aggravating at times, that may live lives that we don't understand, that may throw their sin and flaunt their sin in our face, that may be doing a lot of things, God wants to remind us that they are his creation. We're not taking this gospel to just anybody. They are special because they are his creation. That means we must look past the sin and see who they are to God and what they are to God. We have to look past how wicked and ungodly many are and we must see them as God's special creation that needs the gospel. When we get a hold of that, then what that means is it will keep me from holding back from giving the gospel to anyone regardless of what my personal opinion or belief may be. I see the promise, the reach of this promise, the reality of this promise induces me. But I want you to notice not only is there a universality in the promise, but there's a necessity in the preaching of the gospel. Go back with me, if you would, in Romans chapter number 10. The first link in the chain of missions that Paul describes is the person who calls upon the Lord Jesus and the promise is that they will be saved. But then from that link, Paul backs up and he points us to the step that precedes the one in the work of missions, the preaching of the gospel. Notice how he does it in verse number 14. Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they, uh, how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? Or shall, how shall they hear without a preacher? With this verse, we're reminded that no one will ever call upon the name of the Lord Jesus without someone coming to them and telling them about him. There's a sentiment that I believe this verse combats. 
I fear there are believers who rarely uh, think about the work of missions because they've numbed themselves with the notion that those who do not hear the gospel will somehow be all right or somehow it's God's responsibility. You understand, God could have got the gospel any way he chose to the world. But his plan was to give the great commission to you and I. Our pastor said it right this morning, missions does not start in other countries. It starts with our personal soul winning next door and at our jobs and in our neighborhood and and, and, and just everywhere around us as we live life. But as it does go out, may I say to you and I that we've numbed ourselves somehow to think that, that people will be all right. And I'm telling you, they will not unless people turn to Jesus Christ in faith and repentance. They will die in their sins. They'll spend eternity away from God and none of us want that one man wrote the 10th chapter of Romans makes it clear that salvation requires faith that faith requires hearing the gospel and no one will hear the gospel unless someone proclaims it to them the biblical message of the gospel rules out any form of religious pluralism or inclusivism, leaving the entire human race dependent on the spread of the gospel for their eternal destiny. In other words, we cannot adopt the modern sentiment of live and let live. I'm okay, you're okay. We're all going to heaven one day. No, those who do not believe the gospel are not going to be okay. And God has challenged and commissioned us to give it. I see the sentiment this verse combats, but I see the silence this verse condemns. The word of God states, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That promise is sure. And yet that person calling on the name of the Lord will never do so without first someone proclaiming who that Lord is, whether it be through a tract that's been given, whether it be through a Bible that's been given, whether it be through a message, whether it be through a personal witness, someone has to proclaim Jesus to that sinner. Paul says, how will they call on the Lord? And I'm paraphrasing, how can they call on the Lord that they don't believe? And how are they going to believe in a Lord in which they, they, they've not heard? And, and how, are they, how are they going to ever hear about them unless someone tells them, preaches to them? I'm saying to you and I, unless you and I, unless someone who knows about the Lord preaches the gospel to those who does, do not, those who do not will never believe upon him. You and I are Christians who rarely, if ever, actually share the gospel. Those words ought to crush our souls. You say, but preacher, I want people to be saved. I want my neighbors and I want people in every nation to know Jesus. But our silence with the gospel only helps seal their judgment. It's because you and then me and thousands like us that will not proclaim the gospel is the reason so many have never heard the gospel. People are not saved because we wish they were or hope they would be. Our desire for people to believe the gospel is no replacement for our declaration of the gospel. But then number three, there's a responsibility in the progress of the gospel. While it's true that every one of us faces the necessity of preaching the gospel, not every one of us can preach that gospel everywhere. Not all of us can leave this place and go to all the places where the gospel needs to go. Not everyone can go to the Philippines or Africa or India or Latin America. Paul understood this, which is why he described yet another link in that chain of missions. There's a final rhetorical question at the beginning of verse number 15. Paul asked, how shall they preach except they be sent? Truth be told, here's where the majority, the vast majority of you and I must participate in the mission of missions. You have to be a sender of the ones who will preach the gospel to those who will hear it, believe it, and call upon the name of the Lord. Sending is the responsibility most Christians are going to carry in the progress of the global gospel. Notice the process of sending. Verse number 15, you see that word sent? 
It's a word connected closely with our word apostle, and it describes someone who's set aside and then sent out for a particular tax. Uh, and in the context of our passage, it is, a, uh, it is what we call a missionary. The missionary is one set aside from among us for the work of the preaching of the gospel to go to places where we cannot go. How exactly is that missionary sent out from us? The answer is simple. He's sent out by us. That's the job of the church. Let me cut to the chase. Missionaries cannot go out to preach the gospel unless people like us are willing to support them financially in their work. Many times when you announce missions conference, the first thing hits many people's mind. I pastored for many years. Oh, no. Pastors want more money from us. Reminds me of the story I read of about a mother that wanted to teach her daughter about giving and a moral lesson. And so she gave, uh, going to church that morning, she gave her little girl a quarter and a dollar for church. And she looked at her daughter as they were going in. She said, now I want you to put whichever one you want in the collection plate and keep the other for yourself. Well, when they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter, did you put the dollar in or did you put the quarter in? What amount did you give? Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar. But just before the collection and the offering, the man in the pulpit said, we should all be cheerful givers. She said, I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the quarter, so I did. (laughs) Many times when it comes to missions, the first thing we think is money. Money is certainly not the only support we offer to the work of missions, but without our money, the work of missions is virtually impossible. I'm glad the gospel is free, but the piping cost. Money doesn't make the world go round, but it does help those go around the world. And as the sending link in the chain of missions, there's no disputing that my financial investment and your financial investment in missions is a major part of our participation in missions. With that being said, does it bother you that the average American Christian gives about a penny a day to the work of global missions from the latest statistics I read? Does it concern you at all that many people will spend more on cable television and their internet this month than they'll give in the foreign mission offering? You say, you're just trying to make me feel guilty. No, I'm just trying to bring us to a reality and the truth of how important this is. People, I told you the numbers, people are dying and going to hell every hour, every snap of the finger, two people are dying and the majority of them are going to hell and you and I have the ability, we have the cure, we have the remedy, but we have to get it to them. I read from an independent sector, a Washington-based nonprofit organization that conducted a study on private giving to charity, and here's what it said. The average church member contributes between 1.5% and 2.5% of their income specifically to the Lord's work. The study found that households with incomes below 10,000 gave an average of 2.8% of their income, while households with income between 50,000 and 100,000 gave away only 1.5%. Nearly half of the total contributions to charity in the U.S. comes from households with incomes below 30000 The average total giving to charity per household was $790. If we're not going to go ourselves to preach the gospel in some uttermost part of the world, then we have a responsibility to send someone who will. And if we won't send them and they can't go, then the gospel won't be preached and then people won't hear and they cannot believe and they cannot call on the Lord and they will not be saved. I can't say it any clearer than that, but then I'm not the one who said it. This is what the text says. This is what the word of God says. So as we consider our responsibility in the progress of the gospel, think with me not only about the process and I'm about done, but notice the pattern for sending. I want you to look in that word sent in verse 15. I find it interesting that that word sent not only refers to our part as senders in the work of missions, but it refers to the original gospel sending work. 
Jesus said it like this in John 20, 21, when we read the words, Jesus said to, to them, uh, peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Think about that. The Lord has rose, he's resurrected, he's fixing to go back to heaven. And one of the, the first things he says to them after his resurrection is, as the Father sent me, what Jesus, what the Father sent Jesus to do? To seek and save that which was lost. He fulfilled his purpose and he said, as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. That word sent he said the Father sent him. It's the same word we find in Romans 10, 15. Think about that. The Father loved us enough to send his Son. Our sending work and missions then is really just a reflection of the heart of our Father. When you do your part in the chain of missions as a sender, you're, not, you're only doing what was first done by a loving God. God had only one son, David Livingston said, and he made that son a missionary. When I plead with you to do your part to send preachers of the gospel around the world, I'm only calling you and I to do what God first done for us. If people are going to hear the gospel in those remote places, it's going to be because someone sent a preacher. I'm closing. There was a book written I don't know much about the author, so I won't give the author's name just in case there's young or new Christians in here, but it was a very powerful book and had a lot of good things. And, and there's a section where the author deals with this text that I've just tried to preach, and he argues that almost every step in the process Paul describes here will work without fail. Now think about it. People who call on the Lord will be saved. There's no, no, no failing in that at all. They will call when they believe. If you really believe, you're going to call. And though not all, many will believe when they hear the gospel. So the only possible breakdown that author argued is when the people of God do not do the work of getting the gospel, preaching the gospel to all peoples. I'm saying tonight, church, Bridgeport, Michigan, pastor has done a great job uh, since I've been here of really trying to get our church and our name and what we do, not for our sake, but for the gospel's sake of the community. And our church has such a great testimony in the community. But may I say, the only possible breakdown that can occur in the gospel going to the world, God said, this church right here, we might as well talk about this one, Bridgeport, First Baptist Church of Bridgeport can be a strong link in that chain or we can be a weak link. We can focus on a lot of things or we can focus on what God wants us to do. And the question tonight is, are we a weak or broken link in that chain as individuals that make up this body of believers? You may never go to some foreign field. You may never be a missionary, but I submit to you tonight, missions are your mission. Missions is my mission, and everything that God wants us to do should be centered around how do we get the gospel to someone else. Can I tell you, your money spent in missions will go far greater for you when you stand before the Lord than any other investment you're going to make. When the church says give to missions, you understand that the money that's given to missions it does not go to, 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 to pay salaries and the light bill. That's the tithe and that's the offerings that's generated by the church. When you give the missions, you can rest assured that money is being used to go all over the world to do one thing. Get the gospel to that five, six billion people that don't have it yet. When you support missions, you're supporting Austin Cowley. I'm assuming pastor's going to take him on. There's still a little hesitancy there. I, I think about Brother Cowling and God, Brother Cowling, Brother Rupal in Cambodia. Look at all the souls that's been saved. This church has had an investment in that. This church invests in our ministry. On the average, we see, I don't know how many souls a day. What I can tell you right now, we had an accountant that figured it up. For every, right now, every six cents, that's every six pennies that's given to Operation Go, we can guarantee someone's getting saved for every six cents that you put in our ministry. 
in the country of India for every penny that people give to help us in India, we can guarantee a soul's getting saved. What better investment can you get on your money than to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you help get the gospel around the world. Are you a strong link in the missions here at First Baptist or would you be a weak link?